Welcome back to RPTV Weekly News. I'm Gabriel, and joining me today is Fred, Thundercloud, Jay Bin, and Kidar. Together, we bring you updates on stories that directly impact Regent Park and surrounding areas, and where we bring you the latest updates on community initiatives shaping the future of the neighborhood. In this episode, we delve into the latest news from May 2nd, 24th to June 1st. Stay tuned for the latest updates and insights affecting our community. Firearm discharge in Region Park. Police seek information. 2024 TCHC Toronto Community Housing Summer Safety Jam is back. TCHC and Triadet launch Region Park Scholarships Program. Community explores Toronto Council Fire Native Culture Center at Doors Open Toronto 2024. TNG Women's Program mobilizes against healthcare privatization. Building Roots unveils Moss Park Chronicles, capturing community stories. TDSB Toronto District School Board creates programs celebrating curiosity within visual arts exhibition and performances. Toronto Public Health reports surge in opioid toxicity deaths, events and jobs in Region Park community. Firearm discharge in Region Park. Police seek information. In the early hours of May the 27th, Toronto Police responded to a report of a gunfire in the Region Park neighborhood at approximately 4.18 a.m. Gunshots were heard near Sackville Street and Girard Street East. Upon arrival, officers from 51 Division found evidence confirming that a firearm had been discharged. Fortunately, no injuries have been reported in connection with this incident. However, police are urging anyone with information to come forward to aid in their investigation. Residents with any details related to the gunfire are encouraged to contact the Toronto Police Service at 416-808-5100. Information can also be shared anonymously through Crime Stoppers. The Toronto Police Service continues to prioritize safety and security of the Regent Park community and is actively investigating this incident to prevent future occurrences. Summer Safety Jam is back. The 2024 TCHC Toronto Community Housing Summer Safety Jam made a vibrant return on June 1st at Regent Park's Big Park, 600 Dundas Street East. This lively event marked the kickoff to a safe summer in the Regent Park community. Organized in partnership with community safety partners, local organizations, and artists. The celebration highlighted the importance of safety in the neighborhood. The Summer Safety Jam featured a halal barbecue sponsored by Enbridge and the Toronto Police, live DJ and performances, including a youth drumming group, All Nations Juniors, and art by Benny Bing, workshops by Square Circle, a bazaar with local vendors, a cricket demo, and neighborhood tours added to the excitement. Neighborhood community officers shared videos on Instagram showcasing the event's vibrancy. Here we are at uh, Regent Park community event. There's a uh, PC Summers. Bones to Castle, cotton candy, ice cream. The Summer Safety Jam underscored the commitment to ensuring a secure and lively environment for Regent Park and its surrounding neighborhoods. Hey everyone, we're at the uh, Regent Park Community Center. We're having the Regent Park event today. Come and join us. PC Summers, you got anything to say? Yeah, come out and join. We got hot dogs, we got vendors. Come out and check it out. TCAC and Tridel launch Region Park Scholarship Program. Toronto Community Housing and Tridel announced the launch of 2024 2025 Region Park Scholarship, an initiative designed to honor the contributions of Region Park tenants while nurturing the educational aspirations of the community's next generation leaders. Eligible Regent Park TCAC tenants aged 17 and older are invited to apply for the scholarship, which offers up to $3,000 to cover tuition fees, 
along with $500 bursary for additional costs. The application deadline is Monday, June 24th, 2024 at 4 p.m. To learn more about this amazing opportunity, applicants can attend an information session either online or in person. The Regent Park Scholarship aims to provide financial assistance to students pursuing post-secondary education while fostering community involvement and leadership. It reflects TCAC's commitment to addressing the needs of Regent Park tenants and promoting educational equity. For further details, applicants can contact talkregentpark at torontohousing.ca or call 437-231-7874. Community Explorers Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Centre at Doors Open Toronto 2024. Recently, Doors Open Toronto invited the public to explore the city's most beloved buildings and sites for free. Among the highlights was Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Centre located in the Regent Park, Cabbage Town area, founded in 1976. Council Fire established a permanent home at 439 Dundas Street East in May 1997. This move allowed for the expansion of its support services and skill development initiatives. The centre, which serves over 175,000 clients annually, is currently undergoing a period of restructuring and revitalization. As one of many Aboriginal service providers in the Greater Toronto Area, the centre addresses the social, health, education, economic and cultural needs of Toronto's urban Aboriginal population. It offers a wide range of services, including housing help, income support, education, employment training, clinic referrals, detox and treatment referrals, and volunteer opportunities. During Doors Open Toronto, visitors had the chance to tour the facility, which features workshop areas, classrooms, a kitchen, and offices. The Centre's food support programs are a critical resource for the community, providing breakfast for up to 90 people and lunch for 125 people daily. The food bank operates bi-weekly, serving those in need. Regent Park reporter Fred Alvarado visited the centre and witnessed firsthand the dedication of the staff who warmly welcomed guests and proudly showcased the vital work, the centre's role as a cornerstone of support and empowerment for the community within the urban indigenous landscape of Toronto. My name is Amanda Lipinski and my role here at Council Fire is cultural wellness navigator. So I work with all the sectors within the organization here, providing support where needed, also working within the um, community with the different elders, knowledge carriers, to provide that cultural piece, which is so important with all the programming. And Council Fire, as I've said before, is very authentic in what they do. And that connection to cult culture is what makes the centre what it is. It's actually my first time being a part of this event, and I was surprised at how big it is, um, all the different buildings that you have access to these next two days. So I think it's cool that Council Fire is a part of it too, just so we can spread uh, more awareness within the community of what Council Fire does, the services we offer, and how we work within the community um, and people of all all nations, not just Indigenous people. So a lot of work gets done here. So anyways, yeah, it's a great event. The weather's not on our side today, but that's okay. It's supposed to maybe clear off around 2. So, And we've, had a, we've still had a couple of people come through, even though it's been a little rainy, but it's still been good. Thank so, you, Amanda. Yeah. And I, I can see that there are some brochures here and some uh, um, materials here. here you're yes. showing. Yeah. What, what, what are you... Uh, so this like, here is yeah. is basically all of Council Fire's um, sectors of programs and services. Yeah. So we've got a little bit of information about what each sector does and the services they offer. Um, and then this document here uh, just talks about the history of Council Fire. It's been 48 years since uh, it first started, which is pretty special. This here is all self-care items. We've got sweet grass spray, tobacco roll-ons, some verdure saw, and some Epsom salts and candles, all locally made by Indigenous artists, all for self-care, because we know how important that is taking care of ourselves. Thank you. And yeah. lastly, 
what are your thoughts of the importance of council fire in the community? Oh, that's huge. Council fire plays a very big role within the community. That, like I said earlier, that um, that connection to culture and that authenticity, you know, and not to mention all the actual services that are offered from downstairs in the gathering place, feeding people throughout the week, the cultural activities that we offer for the community, and as mentioned, we work with all nations, all walks of life. So Council Fire plays a big role within not just this this neighborhood, but the city of Toronto, and really all over Canada because we have people from all over Canada that land in Toronto so their family stretches everywhere so there's a big connection there. I've been working at Toronto Council Fire for the past uh, 20 years off and on. I've been here since I was 21. Um, um, we have a lot of different programs here. It started off in the gathering place, uh, coordinating down there and I made my way upstairs and started working with youth. So you guys are gonna have a chance to go upstairs and see the end of this program, but that's where I started. And eventually it moved me to working with families because my youth got older. <laughs> okay. And there were my youth no more now being adults. Uh, my program's a cultural resource um, program. Um, I'm also the community uncle and uh, resolution of health support, cultural support. And so my job in the building is to um, help with culture and all the programs the best I can. You know? mm -hmm. Our programs are we run we run a family night, right? Uh, where we invite all the families out to come sit around and drum and uh, learn a um, a fun way to celebrate without drugs, alcohol, right? And uh, in that big drum on, we do dancing, we do singing, we teach our youth those type of things. You know, our elders come sit and listen. We up with any things in there once a week and we sing for the community all day. Our youth here at Toronto Council Fire actually got really good at singing and then they travel around the powwows, um, didn't play singing, so you know, set to them, and the bass, and one of those battle drum groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got pretty famous in Toronto, I guess. They, were, they, they had the opportunity to sing for Toronto Make the Leafs, so the uh, first person they did the opening for that. So they did the opening for the Toronto Raptors, nice. so they did the openings. We were Toronto Argonauts, and did the openings for the Toronto FC twice. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, I think the favorite game that we did was we were in the same lineup that was Jesse Reyes and President Obama. Okay, so I'm Errol Hernandez and I uh, work at Council Fire here uh, in the education sector. I've always been in the education sector since I've been here. I've been here about 15 years. Now in the education sector, we do primarily literacy and basic skills. And in that context, we have done other things in the past, but currently it's mostly literacy and basic skills. In that context, we have uh, basic computers, communications, math, and art and wellness. Uh, the art and wellness is actually uh, done by a graduate of the Toronto Art Therapy Institute. So it has a specific kind of form to it and a specific ob uh, objective. So it's not like art class, the re you know, paintings, whatever. It's really processes that, that they do. Uh, each class is one day a week. Um, this is our main classroom. Uh, we have a second one next door, and we have a, uh, in the, get the presentation room across from the elevator. That's where we do classes according to how large they are as well. It's, it's a generic room used for many things. Um, program's been running for at least 20 years in some form or another, and we do field trips uh, to the museum, Art Gallery of Ontario. In the summertime, we have art and wellness and communication classes outside in the Regent Park um, park area, right? Uh, we sometimes do trips to the library, or we sometimes uh, promote and request arts and crafts to be done by other sector leads on that no uh, background in the cultural basis of the arts and craft, and that might also involve a field trip like out to Lake Ontario or something like that, right? Um, that's more or less, that's, I think that's more or less what we do. Yes, no problem. Is that being built? Okay, so uh, that is the Spirit Garden. So the Spirit Garden is being built at Nathan Phillips Square. This particular PowerPoint here is actually showing the, co the construction uh, update, right? where the progress of the construction at this point in time. 
this point being May, right? And it's going to be opening up on uh, September 27th, and we've been working at this for over five years. So September 27th, we're having four days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Traditionally, we have three days. We've been doing it over five years for three days, and now it's the opening year, right? Initially, it was called the IRSS, as in Indian Residential School Legacy uh, Project, uh, renamed Spirit Garden, and the event, we call it the Indigenous Legacy Gathering, right? We're kind of moving towards the, the term gathering for several things, right? Uh, this is a fly-through uh, uh, done through the architectural uh, concept that basically shows how the, the um, it's like a video of it, but it hasn't existing yet, so it's an animation, and it basically shows what the layout would look like. So at Nathan Phillips Square, it's the south end on the west side, so it's really it's really the south half of the square, from Queen Street up to where the Japanese Peace Garden ends, right? and then the Japanese Peace Garden have the other half, the northern half. Um, very uh, ambitious project. That's the outcome, an interpretation of one of the Truth and Reconciliation recommendations, call to action, so building something out in the land. This is to be a place that will have ongoing throughout the year events and activities. So it's not just build it and go away and you know leave it to the public to interpret themselves. There'll actually be events uh, at the place. There's a longhouse, which is part of the, uh, the sort of stable community living of the some um, nations in the indigenous community. And the longhouse is large enough to actually hold people um, and actually have events. There's also open air, sort of like amphitheater kind of space where you can hold outdoor events, right? So there'll actually be events of some kind. Uh, there's a, a indigenous plants, uh, to ind plants indigenous to the area through the indigenous culture. So there's a lot of symbology that's gone into it and a, a lot of uh, artwork that interprets the traditions and then presents them as physical form out on the spirit garden. TNG Women's Program mobilizes against healthcare privatization. Women residents of Regent Park and surrounding areas convene at the Central Neighborhood House on 349 Ontario Street for a critical campaign against healthcare privatization. Led by Tohida Chowdhury of TNG Community Services. The event aimed to raise awareness and mobilize support against the Ford government's push for healthcare privatization. Michelle Robido from the Ontario Health Coalition delivered a compelling presentation shedding light on the imminent threat posed to the public health care by privatization efforts. With a shared commitment to safeguard essential health services, the women resolved to take action against privatization. The campaign highlighted various areas under threat, including core hospital services, primary care, public health, long-term care, and more. Concerns were raised over the potential consequences of privatization, such as reduced accessibility and quality of care. To counter these threats, TNG encouraged community members to engage in outreach efforts, distributing pamphlets, putting up posters, and engaging in conversations with neighbors and families. The women's voices were also heard at the rally and march on May the 30th, opposing healthcare privatization and advocating for the preservation of public health services. The Ford government is dismantling public hospital services. In the hospitals, we have surgeries, diagnostics, other services, and they are privatizing them. They are taking them out and privatizing them for profit. Companies are making profit off of this. They are um, pr also privatizing long-term care. They, are pri they have already privatized home care. They are uh, pri uh, privatizing primary care, your, your family doctor, if you're lucky to have one. Um, and so that is what is happening right now. These are all of the things that they are privatizing. They couldn't uh, privatize these services unless they dismantle our public hospitals. This is a conscious decision. 
And so what they've done is they underfund the hospitals. Mm -hmm. The hospitals in Ontario this past year got one half of 1% increase in their funding. They have increased the funding, so that's that, mm -hmm. for all the hospitals. Inflation, at a minimum, was at 6%. Mm -hmm. They've increased the private clinics 212%. And uh, they're creating a crisis in the hospitals so that then they, people will say, well, what choice do we have? <coughs> what we're asking everyone is to spread the word and make it heard so that Queen's Park knows that there's going to be a revolt if they do this. It's already underway. We, know, we all know it when we go to the hospital, when we go to the, even to the doctors, when we, uh, even uh, when you, uh, you know, when you're trying to find a family doctor, the system is in a crisis that was created. And so we need to protest. What we do in the next few months is going to make a huge difference. And we have to slow this process down and stop it. And so this is the question today. Are we going to have a system like in the US where the single biggest cause of bankruptcy in the US is catastrophic medical mm -hmm. costs that the individual pays. So everyone, everyone is affected. Everyone who doesn't have money, everyone who doesn't have money is affected. The people who have money, they're not worried. Mm -hmm. yeah. But for the rest of us, That's which is the most of us, <laughs> but, and the last thing I want to say is, is my mother, when she was growing up, you know, she was born in 36. Uh -huh. When she was growing up, her family couldn't afford the doctor. And uh, her mother got sick. And it was always a question, she got cancer. Were they going to call the doctor? Was she going to go to the hospital? Could they afford it? They, it's, those, it's that situation that led to the fight after the, the war and after all of that for a public Medicare. They fought hard, and the people who opposed them are the same ones opposing today, who want, it, they want to make money off of a human, a human right. So most young people don't remember that history. I, rem I don't remember it. My mother told me about it. But we have to remind people that the situation you're talking about, the situation in the US, many, many countries, ha they don't have what we have right now, and we have what we have, which is not perfect, because we fought for it. So we have to fight. Tell people about it. Explain why it's important, because we're, this is a long fight. We are, we are getting ready. We want every person in every community to understand what we are about to lose, because we are about to lose it if we don't fight. Mm -hmm. It's that serious. I've never seen anything like this. Uh, and I've been on this campaign for a long time. Uh, uh, so uh, anything that we can do together to, to get people out, make signs in all the languages that are in this room, make a sign that says this, let people know. Our reach will grow with every person, every person that can say this in your own community, in your own family, in your own neighborhood, in your own workplace. That's what we need to do. <laughs>
Hi, my name is Taylor Simsevic. I am a graduating student from University of Toronto. I studied diaspora and transnational studies with minors in sociology and human geography. And I got involved with the Moss Park Chronicles as a student with the multidisciplinary urban capstone project at U of T. I was partnered with Building Roots and we developed a um, community partnership program. And as part of that, I helped to create the Moss Park Chronicles website in creating the ideas and creating some of the pages and text for the website. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, my name is Malak. I'm also a graduating student from the University of Toronto, and uh, I was responsible for designing and creating the website digitally. Hi, my name is Charles. Um, I also went to U of T, but that was a few years ago. Um, so I've been working with an organization called Building Roots, uh, and I'm the development and communications person. Uh, Building Roots is a grassroots uh, nonprofit. Uh, we work primarily in Toronto's e uh, East End in the uh, Moss Park area. Uh, we focus on uh, providing fresh food access to the community and a bunch of other uh, wellness programs. So uh, this is really a project we work with um, students like Taylor and Malek to create a website to bring more awareness to uh, Moss Park, uh, to give people a better understanding of uh, the people, the community, the businesses, and all the great things that are happening in the neighborhood. Our partnership with Building Roots, first of all, uh, was originated from our capstone project, which was a uh, full year course uh, specifically designed for last year students at the University of Toronto, where all the students were partnered with organizations of their preference. Ours, of course, was Building Roots. We were lucky enough to be partnered with them. And once we started working with them, we were, you know, we had many uh, brainstorming sessions where we were wondering how we could help them, what was the greatest area of need for Moss Park as well as Building Roots and we ultimately decided on the Community Leaders Program as the best course of action and in doing that once we started talking about the Community Leaders Program the the idea of the Moss Park Chronicles website came about and we really loved it. It was a way to not only document the progress that we were making with the Community Leaders Program but also we thought it would be a wonderful uh, you know, platform in the future to uh, promote Moss Park and help its residents with exposure and publicity and all of that. So that's how it came about. Um, if you want to add, yeah. We also, in creating the um, Chronicles website, we decided to branch out further than just the um, than just the work that we had done with the community leaders and we decided to highlight stories of the neighborhood and histories of the neighborhood that we thought helped to define and situate where Building Roots works out of and where the community leaders are working out of in order to um, expand the scope of everything. <laughs> um, we're really lucky to have them because um, um, there are actually five students all together from the project. Um, the two of you are most actively involved with the website, but they all come from very different backgrounds. Um, I like you. Know, I know you're in uh, politics and international relations. Uh, Taylor is in geography and you know social sciences. Uh, we also have someone from an architecture background, someone from um, business background, um, and it's great to have all those different. Uh, disciplines and their expertise to bring into our work um, so then we can look at our neighborhood through a different lens and it's been incredibly informative to you know make our work better and more relevant. One of the actively ongoing aspects of the website is those that highlight stories of the neighborhood so we conducted an interview with um, Ezra's coffee and another location in Moss Park and we're continuing to engage with um, local businesses and other organizations to highlight um, what they do. Um, we also thought that in showing the, we, we included bios of our community leaders which helps to show a human face to our 
website and um yeah yeah so the 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 website is nowhere near done it's not something that we thought we were just going to come in and finish in two months and and that's that it's something that we know for a fact is going to be up and coming it's a very continuing project and so uh in in line with the community leaders program uh, which has just started this year, one of the things that we thought of doing was to help the, commu the current community leaders and, of course, any future community leaders to um, express themselves as members of the community through the website. For example, we've some of our community leaders this year, uh, they have interest in photography. Some of them want to do podcasts. Some of them want to do blog writing. Um, and we thought it would be a really nice way for them to share their experiences. Of course, other than what was Taylor, Taylor was talking about with interviewing different small organizations in the community and giving them exposure and allowing them to uh, talk about their business, how they started, getting more personal with their origins and everything like that, and just showcasing how diverse the community actually is. We, we were planning to do uh, on-street interviews to talk about where, where people, for example, buy food in the community and how they thought of Moss Park. And so it's a very personal way um, of talking about Moss Park and I think that shows the stories of its residents really well. Taylor and I were part of a uh, bigger group of students that were involved with Building Roots. They are all amazing and because this course is a multidisciplinary course it m kind of ensured that each one of us came from a different discipline, academic discipline and so when we were brainstorming things about the website or when we were talking about the community leaders program it was really kind of impactful to uh, get everyone's input from a different academic background like you know Charles said architecture background or business background or political background or you know geographical background um, it a lot of us realized that, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Oh, we, I didn't know that because I don't come from that academic background. And we helped build up on each other's ideas to the point where we think we've made a really comprehensive approach to not only the community leaders program, but also the website, which, you know, the other students have indirectly helped with whether, you know, they were in involved or not. I'd also like to add that um, bringing our academic backgrounds to the making the website allowed us to bring our own expertise but we wanted to create a website that was accessible for all people that wanted to read it um, in, in creating it we were thinking about who is the audience of our website and we wanted it to range from people that study Moss Park or that are familiar academically with food security organizations or other community organizations but also just somebody that might be interested in learning more about the neighborhood that they live in or possibly a client of Building Roots that wants to learn more about the projects that they're getting involved in. And I think that having both sides to that brings a really comprehensive understanding to the neighborhood. Yeah, I can give an example. Um, so for example, Taylor, you came from a geography background. Uh, you're also a writer for uh, different journals and newspapers. Um, so one question that we ask ourselves all the time since we work uh, in Moss Park is what is Moss Park? What are the boundaries? So uh, this is something that Taylor had helped us do a lot of archival research. Um, she went to the map library here in, uh, at the university to find out. Um, so basically giving a historical account of how Moss Park come into being, what were the boundaries, how they shifted and what are people's perceptions of Moss Park. So, you know, that piece has a really kind of academic, but also it's apply. You know, it really helped us answer the question of um, why we're here, uh, what is Moss Park? Um, so that was, that was great. I believe the main um, motivation behind creating the Moss Park Chronicles website was the fact that there is very little information about Moss Park online. Uh, there is a huge shortage of information about the stories and the residents and the history and the boundaries and everything that makes Moss Park. And we wanted to fill that. Uh, and we think that the diversity of the website um, helps very well to demonstrate the diversity of the community. And it's just, I think, like one of the first steps to make sure that Moss Park is no longer forgotten, quite frankly. 
I would also say that Moss Park is a neighborhood that's seeing a lot of changes. And I think that the nature of a website is a really great way to showcase um, changing uh, val or not values, changing populations, changing uh, businesses and industries in the neighborhood. And as an ongoing project, um, the website could continue to show these changes and show how um, various aspects are being, um, yeah, changed. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Like it's 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 as we said, this not a project that is just finished or will be finished anytime soon. It's something that will continue to be built up upon and developed, just as Moss Park community itself is being built up upon and developed. And that's the entire point of the website. And we hope that it really does a good job at showcasing everything that is good and everything that is a bit difficult in Moss Park because it's a wonderful community and a wonderful neighborhood. And yeah, we just hope it makes a difference. Awesome. Thank you. Is there anything else you would like you wanna to add? add? Um, <laughs> I guess I also want to say that having, having worked in Mass Park, I've been working there since 2018, 2017, so it's been about six, seven years. Uh, it's definitely a neighborhood that is, um, you know, that has a lot of negative stigma. Um, you know, every time you see Moss Park on the news, it's mostly about crime, it's mostly about, you know, drug use and so on and so forth. And people tend to forget that there are a lot of great things happening. There are, there are really great communities, there are really great restaurants. Uh, there's a really vibrant uh, culture with people from all over the world. Um, and those tend to be the thing that people overlook. So part of the website is really try to bring Moss Park uh, give it, you know, like a truthful representation of what it is. Um, and, you know, because of all the negative stigma over the years, um, there isn't really a whole lot of civic investment in Moss Park in terms of, you know, services and even just like, you know, people don't see it as a destination or somewhere they want to go. So I think part of the website is really try to put Moss Park back in the map, back in the minds of the people so then they they can go and discover and see from themselves rather than, you know, just, you know, kind of seeing all the negative negativity through news reports and so on. So, yeah, just to, um, you know, just want to give uh, people there a voice and um, put them back on the map. TDSB, Toronto District School Board, creates programs, celebrates curiosity with visual artists, exhibition and performances. Recently, the Daniel Spectrum in Regent Park was filled with energy as the TDSB Creates Curiosity Celebration and Gallery Exhibition kicked off. From 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., attendees enjoyed a vibrant showcase of student creativity featuring art installations, demonstrations, and performances in dance, music, spoken word, and film. The free event highlighted the diverse artistic talents nurtured by the TDSB Arts Initiative. The TDSB Creates program connects local artists with classrooms through mentorship and residency programs, fostering creativity in visual arts, dance, drama, spoken word, film, and music. Supported by the TDSB Arts Department, Toronto Arts Council, and Prologue Performing Arts, this program is provided at no cost to schools. The community's strong support for the arts was evident, with attendees thrilled by exhibition and performances that celebrated student voices and creativity. My name is Mary Moynihan. I'm the program coordinator of the arts for the Toronto District School Board. And the event we are running tonight is the culmination of a big project that runs all year long called TDSB Creates. Uh, it's a partnership with the Toronto Arts Council and it brings artists into classrooms to help students to create work in dance, drama, film, music, visual arts, uh, and uh, it, uh, it, it gets students talking about big ideas and creativity. This year our theme is curiosity, so we have artwork here tonight and dance performances, films, and music all created by students uh, with the support of mentor artists through the program.
This program gives students a voice, a platform. Uh, we find students are telling us what they think is important. They're telling us uh, what we as adults need to care about because uh, it's important to them and they're our future. Uh, these programs also bring artists right into the classroom to help students see themselves as artists and see the future uh, in the arts for themselves. It's also a great way for students to, um, to kind of uh, find an outlet, which is really positive for their well-being. Uh, and so we know the arts has a positive impact on students, both academically, personally, in terms of well-being, and then it thus has a positive impact on the community. Now for events and jobs in the community. Hi there everyone, it's Farzad here from uh, Regent Park uh, Community Officer. Uh, we have a very special uh, uh, open house in 51 Division, our station, the station that we go to every day to work from. Uh, on June the 15th, uh, we invite everybody from, uh, from the public to come and join us for a great day of uh, barbecue, music, and to meet uh, all the officers uh, that you would normally see on the streets and maybe you don't have a chance to speak with, including ourselves, myself, and my partner, uh, PC Biga, uh, to have like, a little uh, uh, conversation, have a coffee, and um, enjoy the day and see how we conduct business. So that's June 15th, open house at 51 Division, which is 51 Parliament Street. Hope to see you there. Regent Park Out Loud, second annual block party on June 14th, 3 to 9 p.m. The theme is Know Your Neighbor. The block party will take place at the Regent Park Boulevard. There will be games, karaoke, lounging, story time, and performances. Free trauma-informed fundamental certificate course. Priority for TCHC tenants on Saturday, June 8th from 10 to 5 p.m. at 50 Region Park Boulevard ground floor recreational program. Meals provided. To register, contact Felicia White at felicia.white at torontohousing.ca. The Children's Book Bank in Region Park offers free books for kids. All children and families are welcome. EED is hiring a workforce integrator. The workforce integrator will support the design and implementation of the workforce integration project through engagement and communication with employers, organizations, and residents. Apply to regionparkeed at gmail.com. Region Park Safety Network invites you to join the Community Buddies Safety Walks every Wednesday, 8 p.m. at the Bake Oven. If you have questions, please call Leonard Schwartz at 416-845-5994. And that's all for today's show, folks. My name is Kedar Ahmed, and my co-hosts are Gabriel, Thundercloud, and Jabin, and Fred. We would also like to thank our team of researchers that contributed to this week's show. And from our studios located at Focus Media Arts Center, thank you for watching, and we'll see you all next week. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And please follow our social media platforms. For more information, check out our website.